I just want to welcome everybody to the Caps of Podcast. My guest today is colleague and friend Steve West, a uh, man of many uh, endeavors during his lifetime, a business leader, a community leader, a fundraiser, and a uh, fine arts f- photographer who has uh, just published a book called Beautiful Minds, which we have with us today. So that's a little bit about Steve, but I don't know that much. I know that the Governor <laughs> General knows about you and has said nice things and given you an award, Steve, but if you just want to say hi. and Sure. Well, first of all, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for, for having me. Um, yeah, I've, <clears throat> as you can probably tell right off the bat from my accent, I did not grow up in Ottawa. <laughs> um, I, uh, I am an immigrant. I arrived here in Canada in 1991. Uh, via a whole series of different countries. I was fortunate enough to work in many places in the world, um, in Europe, where I grew up, in London, in, uh, in Africa. Um, I lived and worked in the uh, Asia-Pacific region for 11 years. And, and uh, at the time, I was working for the Molson companies. And they, I think they just felt I was having way too much fun. <laughs> so they, they asked me to come to, to, to headquarters in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, it was at a time in our lives when the kids were young. And it was a good idea. We thought Canada would be a great country to bring up our children. So we moved from Hong Kong um, to Ontario. And uh, I've been here ever since. And uh, came to Ottawa in 2003. Um, having worked uh, for the Molson companies and then Unilever. And then uh, after that, which was in the chemical industry, <clears throat> and after that I uh, uh, rotated into uh, my sort of uh, origins, which was in life science, my degrees in zoology and genetics. Mm-hmm. So I ended up in the health science uh, sector and um, ended up here in Ottawa running a business in health sciences uh, for quite a few years, so um, and eventually became um, you know part of the the fabric of the Ottawa constituency and um, got involved with a whole bunch of uh, community oriented activities as well. For which everyone's grateful for Steve and uh, we met uh, a few years ago mm-hmm. now uh, yeah. through connections to the Royal Ottawa Hospital right. and your interest in the research there. Again, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> but what really brought us together uh, was your desire to influence a f- photography and develop something that hadn't been there before. And so that's a bit of a theme you have. And I just wanted to, you know, what sort of set you on that path and a, a little bit about the uniqueness of your photographic work. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm a strong believer in that um, you, you have to continually adapt and, and when required, kind of reinvent yourself a little bit. You know, and, and I had done that in my career, as I mentioned, going from you know, the chemical industry to, to, to health sciences. So um, I was due a reboot. <laughs> and, um, and, and I had ended up um, actually on the board of the Institute of Mental Health Research at the Royal uh, here in Ottawa uh, through a series of coincidences. And, um, but I ended up on the board. And I do have a background in sort of research and innovation and also in molecular imaging when I was in the health sciences field working. Mm. So there was a lot of sort of reasons to, to be involved uh, in the Royal. And in particular, I was quite excited about uh, the Brain Imaging Center mm. that, you know, is relatively new to the Royal. And uh, uh, I was just intrigued by how we could leverage the Brain Imaging Center in, in research. So, so I was on the board of the Royal and one day we had a presentation about the Brain Imaging Center. And a discussion that sort of went along the lines of we have this great asset, we have this machine that is able to image people's brains. It's the only one in Canada for research. It's not for diagnostics. Um, <clears throat> how are we going to promote it? You know, the community funded it. No. Um, it was close to an $8 million investment. And at the time of that conversation, because it was also new, um, it actually wasn't being fully utilized. 
I'm happy to say today that's not the case. <laughs> it's definitely fully utilized. Um, but it takes time to get clinical research programs in place and so forth. So, you know, there was an idea and it was around, well, why don't we um, sort of publish some brain images of people? And the idea was the people that would have their images published would be well-known people whose names would resonate with the community. And, and there were a few sort of famous minds that said they would be happy to go into the machine. It's an MRI machine, so it's like an MRI. It's a little bit different to the MRIs that, you know, you might have a diagnostic scan done on, um, specifically designed around brain imaging. Yeah. Um, but um, it, uh, you know, the idea was that, you know, we could create this kind of <clears throat> public, you know, publicity. And, and after the discussion, I went into the office of the, uh, the leader of the IMHR at the time and said, you know, that's a good idea, but wouldn't it be more interesting if we had some stories and some portraits, photographs of the people themselves? Mm. So not just their, you know, their brains. Um, so, you know, that kind of took, you know, traction. And I was a closet photographer at the time. Um, and, and unbeknown to me, the leader of the time, Zul Morali, uh, was also a bit of a closet photographer. So he thought that was a great idea. So at the time, I was doing a um, part-time course at the School of Photographic Art in Ottawa and realized that, that I didn't know how to take portraits, but I wanted to be involved in this project. And all of that came to sort of one day the sort of epiphany of, well, why don't you actually, you know, reinvent yourself as a photographer? And I was doing some consulting work. I, I, you know, we had sold the business that I was running and I was doing a whole bunch of things, but nothing dramatically different or new. And we all need things sometimes to stimulate us, get us out of our comfort zone. No. So um, right at the last minute, in terms of applications, I submitted a portfolio and I was accepted into a two-year full-time program as a student. Most of my classmates were millennials, um, completely irreverent, <laughs> to, you know, took great joy in mimicking my British accent and other <laughs> things. But in return, I became world-class at Snapchat and uh, TikTok and other things <laughs> that, <laughs> that are millennial tools. So, um, and I, and so I, I did the diploma for two years. Mm. Um, I managed to get it done. I mean, the last second year, it's a two-year program. The second year was just as COVID was breaking, mm. but we got through most of it. And <clears throat> so as a result of that, my project became this book, Beautiful Minds. So that's how we got there. Yeah. Um, and of course, like all good projects, both scientific and artistic, they don't always go according to plan. <laughs> <laughs> so this did not go according to plan. <laughs> The idea of the sort of the famous minds uh, did not get traction for a variety of reasons. And I think um, that's when you and I had a discussion. Yeah. And uh, as you know, uh, I came to you one day and said, I have this crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I explained to you, you know, we weren't getting traction and getting people to act. People that said they would be happy to go into the brain scanner suddenly had second thoughts. And um, for whatever reason. And so not only that, but I didn't, I didn't think that the, the idea was really impactful. I mean, it was almost a bit elitist. And, and so we, we pivoted. I know everybody uses that word these days. But the, some people actually pivot. But we did pivot. Yeah. Um, we kind of did a 180. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, I came to you and I said, you know, I have this project. Um, I think it'd be a great way to talk about stigma, mental health, and substance use disorders. So you and I worked together on this. Uh, so thank you, first of all, for supporting this, this, this project. Um, and in the book here, what we have are a series of portraits of people who have lived experiences, um, some of their brains, including yours, that have been um, remapped by me. So 
<clears throat> a lot of the images, they're not really, they're brains. They started out as brains, but they've become pop art. They become visual art because I've used software and imaging software to take what are effectively black and white images that look like x-rays yes. and turn them into something colorful and different. And, 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 um, and so we have brain scans, portraits, and we have stories. And one of the most amazing, I mean, I learned so much in putting this, this book together, particularly when talking to those folks who shared their stories. And nobody that wanted to be in this book had any issue in either sharing their story or sharing their portrait. Mm. And, yeah. and so they wanted their story to be told. They wanted people to hear their stories. And they're very powerful stories. They're stories of lived experience of either substance use disorders or family, mm. you know, clients. Mm. It, so there's a mix in there. Even my story is in there. Your story is in there. Your brother's story is in there. And we have, I think, just wonderful stories. And, um, you know, what came through to me when we were putting the material together was the power of the resilience mm. of the stories, which challenged me as a photographer to get a consistent look of, you know, strength and resilience yes. um, in the portraitures. And that's what I wanted to, to, to portray. I was not even though we're all vulnerable in many different ways, I was not wanting to demonstrate vulnerability. I wanted to demonstrate resilient strength in coming through. And everybody has come through. So all of the stories are people that have gone in one side and come out the other side. Yeah. Well, and, and I think for me, Steve, part of that brilliant part for me, the part that I just fell in love with the book was the fact that the stories are the vulnerability. I'm telling you my truth, right? But I myself, right, am resilient and strong. Absolutely. You're right. <clears throat> and to have those two lenses, so to speak, you know, pun intended, uh, at the same time, has created uh, a work as the same thing, giving background around the importance of brain research going forward, what's available for people. And I think in some ways setting the table uh, for more of this sort of work going forward and to reach across Canada and say, who wants to join us in strength and vulnerability? Uh, who wants to be a beautiful mind uh, for the next version? Well, that was um, that was a component of the the project. Uh, this book um, is is just really the first chapter mm. um, in 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 a sort of a, a whole project, um, and and I was constrained with time. Um, getting it all done, it, you know, became part of what I wanted to complete before I finished at SPAL, so I could leverage all the, the knowledge and experience there, um, because you learn a lot about being a portrait photographer. Um, and I want to come back to that a little bit, because I kind of think of myself as a portrait photographer now. Um, but this, this, this was designed almost to be a sort of a, they call it a maquette sometimes, mm. a showpiece to, to say, look, you know, this is what we've done so far, but I would like to create um, a work, a book, again, um, coffee table style of photographs, images, and stories across the whole of the mental health mm. sort of uh, arena, not just substance use disorders and addictions, but cover all the aspects of mental health. Um, and go beyond that too a little bit in terms of, you know, some of the stories are going to be not just a lived experience, but researchers, yeah. you know, clinicians, obviously family members, you know, clients of, of, of the Royal, people doing clinical trials yeah. who volunteered you know, to go into the scanner, um, you know, and so they're part of a trial where there may be some behavioral, you know, component or pharmaceutical. So pharmaceutical companies are now using the brain imaging center to do research. Yeah. So <clears throat> you, try, you know, trying to bring the, the complexity of brain 
uh, neurobiological research to the you know to the world because right now it's sort of shut away you know in in the center and and it's complicated Gord. it's not easy to talk about neurobiology um, <laughs> you know I'm I'm lucky I, I have a you know a background in science I, I uh, happen to have you know worked in the field of molecular imaging so I have a bit of a leg up on this, but even I, you know, my brain hurts when I <laughs> sort of talk about it yeah. um, because it's very complicated. And of course, there's so much we don't know. We don't even know what we don't know. I mean, mm. you, everybody knows the stats over a billion neurons, you know, in the brain firing, mm. you know, and different, you know, very complex organ. And um, we understand a reasonable amount about the structure of the brain but we know very little about the functioning of the brain, the conscious, the subconscious, the mind, and the body. Yes. How they're all interconnected inside of our brains. It's sort of three pounds of sort of gooey gray stuff, mm -hmm. right? Is, is you know, our, our primary controller of, of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the projects that the, the Royal is quite interesting is actually looking at the um, impact of mental health on physical health. And there's quite a correlation between depression and cardiac disease. And that, and that sort of correlation is, is, is actually um, uh, part of the wiring of the brain. There's a piece of the brain that subconsciously manages elements around our sort of... Um, our mind also manages um, subconscious things around our organs. So the heart and the mind are right. actually physically connected in the brain. Right. They're physically connected in an area just behind the, front, the frontal precortex. So, you know, and, and we don't know how it works. No. So the, the, the brain imaging center, what it does or what the machine does, it gives us not just a picture of the anatomy of the brain, the structure, but also at the same time, the functioning. So we, people can be in the, in the, in the machine having, being scanned and we can change their emotions. So, and we can see the changes in the patterns and, and in the, the images that the machine is capturing. It's actually based upon uh, water flow. Mm -hmm. So as you're thinking, let's say you're thinking positive thoughts. No. Certain areas of your brain will react and respond, and if you want, they'll kind of light up. And then, if you're thinking, you know, negative thoughts, then different parts of the brain oh. will be functioning. All of this is giving us information on on how the brain functions, because one of the biggest challenges in mental health is number one, it's underfunded from a research standpoint compared to sort of our physical health. Um, so we again, it's one of the reasons we don't know enough. Yeah. Um, but secondly, when we when we want to treat, you know, mental health um, disorders, we don't have personalized tools. We're trying to treat everybody for very, the same for a very personal <clears throat> experience. Well, you know, the the example that I always use, and you might have heard me use it uh, previously, is if you if you break your leg. Um, you know, you get an x-ray taken of your leg and then, you know, your leg gets reset, right? They don't take a photograph of my, my leg, leg and try and fix your leg, leg right? Too. And that's what we try and do in mental health. You know, we take generic perspectives and we try and, you know, modify the treatment, obviously. But, you know, effectively, we are not using evidence-based personalized medicine for mental health because we just don't have the, the knowledge, the data. So that's where brain imaging um, is so important in understanding how the brain functions, how the mind works, the balance between the conscious and the unconscious. So the next book is about the mask that we wear. Beautiful. Um, the title's still in development, but it, it, you know, it could be the mind in the mask. It might be called beyond the mask. But you know, um, 
our faces, of course, are not the only aspect of how we present ourselves, our behaviors, but we read a lot into facial expressions. Absolutely. I think it's 43 different muscles we have in our face that create over 10,000 different facial expressions. So, um, so the next book is going to be, the portraiture is going to be a little different. Um, in this book, the portraiture is, you know, very um, contemporary, I would say, in photographic style. Yeah. Um, I want to go be a little bit beyond that. I'm working on, so I've created some masks from brains. Yeah, I saw one you on saw your one. website. And it's a bit scary, actually. <laughs> It's good for Halloween. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, historically, you know, masks have been um, a push away in some way, if larger than or bigger than a uh, front, you know. Uh, I remember as a young child practicing smiling in the mirror. And at the time, of course, I wasn't conscious of putting a mask on. I just knew that if I was happy, I got in less trouble. And so I learned how to look happy, and I wasn't the only one in our world. I was learned how to look happy. We teach our children to wear masks from a very young age. And, you know, children sometimes are smarter than we give them due credit for, because intuitively they also learn Mm -hmm. how to manipulate, right, with the tools that they have. They don't have a lot of tools, but one of the tools they have is how they express themselves, both, you know, verbally, visually. And, and so they learn to create, we learn to create yeah. a, a look, a mask, right, for our own purposes. So it's a part of our perception of ourselves and then how we want people to perceive us. So it's kind of, it's a bit complicated and I'm struggling to explain it. I'm working on that uh, <laughs> right now about how to sort of, make it, you know, sort of straightforward and not overly complicated. But mm. I think, you know, from photogra- from a photographic standpoint, we've always been looking at portraits and images and trying to understand what they mean. I mean, the Mona Lisa mm. and the enigmatic smile of the Mona Lisa, which has been analyzed every which way gazillions of times. We still don't have an answer <laughs> on how Leonardo da Vinci, you know, did that. I mean, it's all about light and shadow, which is all about photography. And of course, a lot of photography takes its cues from the old masters and the lighting, you know, of the old masters, the Dutch masters. And, and somebody like da Vinci was a master of understanding light and shadows. And so as a portrait photographer, you know, um, I'm you know, learning light and shadows, but the most important thing as a portrait photographer is the conversation. And if I dare go down this road in some ways, you're bringing mental health substance use out of the shadows and into the light, even while you're working on shadows and light. And so uh, what a wonderful opportunity for our country to get engaged with yourself, Steve, but engaged with each other. Um, you know, this, this book has had impacted people's lives directly already simply by its presence in people's homes uh, because it's a conversation starter. It's a big sign that says, I can talk about these things. I know people, I have friends, I may be someone, but this can be in front of you when you're in my home. And so I see that as uh, this incredible invitation to Canadians to say, this is a true story. We can talk about this. You can have this on your coffee table. Your friends will pick it up and they'll have something to say to you that me never have thought they could say to you before. And you'll be better friends and closer comrades from that. And uh, so I'm really appreciative of that. It's also beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, and part of, as we say in the book, part of the having the conversation is removing stigma. And um, when, when um, each of the storytellers came to the photographic studio, um, I spent uh, an hour just talking with them, mm. about them and their story and sharing my stories too, before we even looked at the camera. Yeah. Because the art of the portrait photographer is not taking the, the picture, the photograph. 
it's it's having the the subject open themselves up to the camera. That's the true skill yeah. involved. I'm still working on it, but you know um, those conversations are in this book, and that's what I want this book and the next one to do is create those conversations. Because as you say, you know, you'd be amazed at what transpires just when you start talking about these issues. Um, this book helped me share my story. And when I share my story, it's amazing how many other stories come to the table from the people that I'm talking to that would never, I don't think, would ever have surfaced. They're there, they, yes. they're there, but you know, they're not, they're buried. Absolutely. Because people still, you know, um, attach stigma to talking about mental health. Um, you know, as, as we're talking today, you know, we're living in a, a, a week of Olympics and where mental health has surfaced. Lovely. In one of the, you know, one of the one very famous athlete who, um, you know, who felt her mental health was was at risk. The fact that you know this now is not seen to be a problem, but seen to be something that we have to accept and resolve, and the fact that it's important. Um, PTSD, for example, is another mental health issue that has so much stigma attached to it or compartmentalized versus the fact that a lot of people have experienced PTSD, not just veterans at the war zone, although that's obviously a significant component, mm -hmm. but even, even in our COVID world now, we have something called moral injury, yes, which, you know, isn't being spoken about enough. Um, but it's significant, you know, for people that have been um, in in healthcare settings, uh, whether they be first responders or long-term care workers or hospital or medical workers who are, you know, getting moral injury because of dealing with, you know, the ramifications of COVID patients. So, you know, we're beginning to realize, I think, finally, that mental health is, is not something that we kind of push to the side and only talk about it when it's a problem. It, it's, it's way more than that. And in fact, like everything in, in our world, it's not hard and fast. You know, um, referencing the Olympics, yeah. um, you know, high-performing athletes generally make the difference not here, but here. Right. It's yeah. the, the, you know, the, sometimes we call it the competitive spirit, mm -hmm. being able to deal with the pain, mm -hmm. the training. But at the end of the day, see, everything is related. It's not just your physical it's capacity to, you know, swim 100 meters in the pool or jump, you know, seven oh. foot something and whatever it is in the yeah. air. It's your it's your capacity to to think about how to do that, how to train, how to endure. And, and then the, one of the other big issues, of course, for a lot of athletes is the anticlimax. So you cannot separate physical health and mental health. Right. You cannot separate our, our, our subconscious from our conscious. You cannot separate our, our, our mind from our body. They're yeah. all interrelated. And so the next book I'm hoping will peel the onion a little bit on oh, some of that stuff. Excellent. I've got two more questions just to finish on a couple of things. We talked, we talked about it, you, you touched on it several times, equity around funding for mental health and substance use health versus physical health. And obviously the answer is not to take money from physical health. So what do you see as the, the solution towards equitable funding for these two conditions that affect us all, whether directly or through family or through colleagues, communities? Um, is it this sort of work where we begin with the conversation? Is that where the conversation ends up with? Uh, and I guess I'm trying to answer the question for you, Steve, so I'm going to be quiet <laughs> now. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's a very profound question um, that I think everybody is struggling with a little bit. I mean, healthcare funding in totality 
is, you know, something we all struggle with. You know, the business models that we have in Canada around healthcare, you know, are being challenged economically, you know, by demographics, by expectations, by knowledge, availability of, you know, resources, um, everything. And, and I think for years we've kind of muddled along. I mean, not just us in Canada or, you know, we're here in Ontario, um, but, you know, generally around the world. Healthcare funding has, has been very reactive, not proactive. Um, when it comes to sort of therapeutics and drugs and things like that, we obviously, it's a lot, to a large degree, have depended upon the pharmaceutical industry, um, which has to a large degree relied upon the blockbuster model previously, you know, which was effectively, you know, a billion dollar drug. It takes $1.3 billion to bring a drug to market, you know, because of all the regulatory aspects. And I've been in that world. Um, so, you know, you kill all the stuff early that doesn't look like it's going to make it. So it's a, it's a broken model mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I think now with, you know, genomics, um, proteomics, uh, you know, our technology platforms are changing so we can be more predictive around, you know, how we build therapies. And I think, you know, we're coming, I think the pandemic is kind of, everybody's had to, you know, stop and think a little bit about healthcare and not just muddle along because we all, everybody got caught, you know, unawares and were unprepared effectively. Yeah. Um, you know, we're trying to get ahead of this virus. And, um, you know, I think we realize now that, that we, we as, a society, as societies, have to embrace healthcare funding. And I'm including mental health in healthcare funding. There, you know, traditionally, cancer has always got secured a lot of funding, heart and stroke has secured a lot of funding um, over the years. Um, mental health, not so much. Um, and I think that of, often that's because families, um, communities, um, societies um, haven't seen the benefit of it, yeah. to be honest with you, because we have never spoken about it, because it's over there, it's not here. I used to be quite involved in fundraising for cancer. And, and, you know, part of the tagline that's often used in cancer um, uh, funding is you, you will know somebody that's had cancer. Could be you, somebody in your family, somebody you work with or a friend. But cancer touches so many people. And it's a great way of making people realize they should fund cancer okay. research. We don't have the same sort of tagline for mental health, right? Yeah. Yes. And, yes. and I, think, I think now we're getting to the point where we may very well start to do that, yeah. where, where we recognize that health is holistic. It's, as I say, you can't separate mind and body. And, and, you need to be, and, and we want quality of life for ourselves, our parents, our children, and successive generations. And so I think a whole notion of our world, which is changing dramatically, and of course we're also dealing with climate change, um, which I actually see not dissimilar to, you know, mental health. If you're going to fund climate change, well, you've got to fund mental health too. So I do think we'll see uh, a shift. I'm not sure it's going to happen quickly. I think we'll see government funding um, become a lot more targeted and specific around mental health. What I'd love to see is outcomes oriented um, mm. funding, you know, um, and that's been a challenge. I think you put money into mental health, you're not sure what's going to happen, where it goes, what happens, and how do you measure it. So I think we need to be smarter mm. around um, funding and outcomes from funding and evidence based. Um, you know, COVID is changed is changing so much in our world. What, um, one of the things that, that has changed the, the Royal is the need to have a more virtual care capability, yes. the prompt clinic. But 
behind the prompt clinic is, is data. So now, you know, we've not really captured the data. That's mm -hmm. all we need to capture the data. You know, now the world of big data, the world of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. these are tools that we can use to understand, you know, effectively evidence-based mental health research, treatment, and prevention. Because it's a cycle, isn't it? Prevention. Mm -hmm. Never goes away. Right. Right, so right, prevention, diagnosis, because a lot of mental health issues don't get diagnosed, yeah. yep. and then treatment, and then back to prevention. So those are the three, you know, that's the, the sort of the, the, the virtual or virtuous cycle of mental health. First of all, you know, it needs to be diagnosed properly before we even treat it. And then we need to make sure we have strategies in place to prevent it. Sure. We need funding in all three areas. I'm not sure I answered the question, but you know that's, that's where I, I, we need to get to. I think very well, Steve. And I think part of that that I heard from my side was that one of the mysteries is what's happened with the money is because we don't have a lot of public advocacy around, Correct. I wasn't well, I'm well now, and I'm living well with something that may not go away, but my health around that is improved. My feelings around that has improved. My connection to the community around that has improved. Because part of this is, yes, there's going to be a lot of people whose health outcomes are going to change. Some people's health outcomes won't change, but the relationship to the community changes through this process. And the relationship to the community to them changes through this process. And that's really uh, a win. Because Compassionate Canada is a more economically viable, better place for others to live in. Absolutely. Country. The other thing is, how do we get the book? <laughs> well, and, and where does the money go? Because I, I, I know part of what you do is make sure that people benefit from your creativity and your ideas. So, so yes. So, um, so the book, um, uh, when I had it printed, I actually had it printed uh, in Europe. Um, because it is, it, it, it comes in soft or hardcover, by the way. Mm. Um, you, the, the, um, the book can be purchased from my uh, website, stephenwest.photography. Um, and there's a, there's a nice Shopify engine there to uh, keep it Canadian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to purchase the book online, either hard or soft copy. Uh, proceeds from the sales of the book are going to CAPSA and the Royal. 50%. I actually, I, I was a bit of a rush this morning. I left, I actually have a check for you, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so yeah, so proceeds from the, the book are, are going to, uh, to, to, to both those uh, wonderful institutions. Um, and then, you know, as I say, the, you know, I hope people will buy the book. They will share the book. The stories in the book are, uh, each story is unique. Each story is powerful, and, and I think many of them will make you, you know, shed a tear or two. Um, and, I've, and I've had feedback about the, the sort of the emotional impact right. of the book, not just the, the photography. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, you talk about funding. I think, you know, uh, I, I funded this project, but the next one's going to require more funding. So, um, you know, I'm going to um, apply to you know, some granting agencies for the arts. Yep. I'm fortunate enough, uh, having completed my diploma and everything, to be an accredited emerging artist from the Canadian Council of Arts. Um, I think there's some corporate funding that, mm. that can help create a book that, again, where we can just share the stories, um, bring out more stories, yes. and, and enhance and enlarge the conversation around mental health. Beautiful, Steve. Beautiful minds, beautiful project. And I realize that the uh, School of Photography has you listed as an emerging artist. Uh, but for me, on a personal level, uh, I will always see you as a leading artist, artistically and scientifically leading change here in Canada to change the outcome of people with mental health and substance use issues going forward. And I'm really grateful to be with you today. Well, I just, uh, you know, once again, appreciate the privilege of being able to talk about it. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Gordon.
たい。